looks because you're black. Well, I am here to help. The Sundance Film Festival will also be online for those who can't make it to the mountain. Mandalit del Barco, NPR News. It's Morning Edition from NPR News. I'm E. Martinez. And I'm Leila Falden. Market Plague's Morning Report is coming up next. And then in 10 minutes at 9 o'clock, it's the BBC News Hour on WNYC. Let's check in with London to see what they're working on. London, good morning. Good morning, WNYC. I'm Tim Franks. On today's news hour, I'll be asking the US Special Envoy to Yemen about the latest strikes against the Houthis. That's BBC News Hour, coming up at 9 on WNYC. Twenty six and partly cloudy out there right now, mostly cloudy today, a high of thirty two. Right now the real feel is in the mid teens. And then tomorrow snow, mainly after eight o'clock in the morning, a high of thirty two. It'll feel colder than that, and we're expecting one to three of inches. One to three inches of snow to actually stick because it's been so, so cold. Maybe more snow Friday night. And then Saturday and Sunday, sunshine, but below freezing temperatures for highs. Right now, 26 and partly cloudy at 8.51. Support for WNYC comes from Yale School of Management Executive Education, presenting Women on Boards, a program that coaches accomplished women to secure a seat at the board table. Live online May 25th and one week on campus in June. More by searching for Yale Women on Boards. New York City in the early 1980s was a great place for Valerie Jimenez. I grew up right on Avenue C. I'm a New Yorican through and through. Change came to her street. People just started like disappearing. Like one day they were there and the next day they were gone. HIV AIDS had arrived and it wasn't just gay men who were getting sick. Join us for Blind Spot: The Plague in the Shadows, a series from the History Channel and WNYC. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. More than 10,000 organizations use the UiPath AI-powered business automation platform to put AI to work. UiPath.com slash marketplace. UiPath, the foundation of innovation. And by Palo Alto Networks. Palo Alto Networks delivers what's next in cybersecurity innovation to protect today's digital way of life. Learn more at paloaltonetworks.com. From Marketplace, I'm Sabri Beneshore, in for David Broncaccio. So usually we talk about the economy with numbers, GDP, retail sales, jobs numbers, kind of like a photograph of how things are going. But there is another way to read the economy, and it is more like an impressionist painting. Eight times a year, the Federal Reserve publishes something called the Beige Book. It is based on interviews and stories from people and businesses across the economy. The latest one is out, and Marketplace's Nova Sappho is our economic art critic today. The Fed's Beige Book is a survey of economic conditions across the bank's 12 districts. It's released ahead of policy meetings to decide on the path of interest rates. The latest report showed easing price increases in almost all Fed districts, and companies surveyed expected wage pressures to continue to ease over the next year. In other words, no big changes to the economy's trajectory. That means the Fed might have plenty of runway before needing to cut rates. Fed Governor Christopher Waller said as much at a virtual forum ahead of the Beige Book's release. The key is we have the flexibility that we can be methodical and careful. In earlier times, a recession would hit some bad negative shock and the FOMC had to move fast and by a lot. That's not the situation we're facing right now. So we can take our time to make sure we do this right. So will the Fed cut interest rates as early as March, as many economists and investors expected heading into this year? Trading on Wall Street suggests investors are reducing their bets on the likelihood of that happening. I'm Nova Safo for Marketplace. China's economy, as we talked about yesterday, grew last year at its slowest pace outside the pandemic in decades, 5.2%. Youth unemployment is still pretty high. But for those who have a job, well, they are working longer hours. In December, the average work week in China was 49 hours. That is 15 hours more than for the average worker in the U.S., for more, here's Marketplace's China correspondent Jennifer Pack in Shanghai. Chinese people work longer hours, partly because companies are trying to do the same amount of work with less staff. 
Also, overtime is baked into China's work culture. In factories, workers get paid a minimum wage plus extra for every product they finish. The more people work, the more they get paid. The high-tech industry is the most extreme, with people working noon till midnight, the so-called 007 work schedule. Tech coders tried to revolt against extreme overtime in 2019, but then China's economy started slowing down. Some tech workers tell Marketplace they stay late not because there's work to do, but because everyone else is still at the office. They want to appear hardworking so that when times are tough, like now, the bosses don't fire them first. In Shanghai, I'm Jennifer Pack for Marketplace. Congress is getting ready to vote on a temporary funding package that would avoid a partial government shutdown Saturday. The Senate reached an initial agreement yesterday, going to vote on that at 12.30 p.m. D.C. time today. If the measure passes the Senate, it would go to the House as soon as tonight. And with that, let's do the numbers. Dow, and Dow futures are down uh, 51 points. That's a tenth of a percent. NASDAQ futures are up nine-tenths of a percent. And S&P futures are up five-tenths of a percent. The yield on the 10-year Treasury is 4.126%. And a federal appeals court yesterday said Apple cannot sell watches with a blood oxygen measuring feature. This is all part of a battle over intellectual property. Medical tech company Massimo accused Apple of using its patented technology for measuring blood oxygen without permission. Apple disagrees and is appealing the decision, but for now, it's disabling the blood oxygen feature, and the watches without it are set to go on sale this morning. Apple stock is up 1.8% in pre-market trading. Marketplace Morning Report is supported by C3 Generative AI. Verified, traceable answers, secure, hallucination-free, LLM agnostic, IP liability-free. Learn more at c3.ai. And by the podcast Ripple, a new investigative podcast from Western Sound and APM Studios. Listen to Ripple wherever you get podcasts. Maybe you have noticed ads for breakfast items popping up for restaurants that were not always so big on breakfast. Taco Bell now has breakfast tacos. Wendy's has English muffin sandwiches. Breakfast and its more formal cousin brunch are in for 2024, according to a recent report from research firm Technomic. Marketplace's Kristen Schwab takes a look at what is behind it all. Once upon a time, brunch was reserved for special occasions like Mother's Day. But now, Dominic Pernomo is serving it every weekend at his restaurant Dayline in New York's Hudson Valley. You know, I think it's a great way for people to get out and enjoy something, especially for those who have families. They can get out during the day. Yes, there's that. But brunch also has better profit margins. For most breakfast places, you know, you're looking at eggs, potatoes, and bread. Those are items that are not especially expensive. That's always been true. But right now, the prices are stabilizing for many of those breakfast staples, says analyst Sean Dunlop at Morningstar. So chicken and eggs and dairy and wheat are all set to be deflationary moving into 2024. And as operators are looking to recover to pre-pandemic profitability levels, that's pretty attractive. Meanwhile, since the pandemic, many fast food restaurants have reduced their dining room hours, which is fine for customers who want breakfast on the go. A lot of brands will just close the dining room and they'll funnel people through the drive through with bare bones staff. But it's not just businesses banking on breakfast. Robert Byrne, director of consumer and industry insights at Technomic, says with inflation, customers are leaning into Eggs Benedict as a way to stick to their budgets and still treat themselves. That breakfast spend is actually going to be lower. So for a consumer who loves restaurants, we all do, right, to some degree, they're just flipping the script and going to breakfast or brunch because it's less expensive. That means they have room to order a side of pancakes and maybe a mimosa. The proof? Byrne says 70% of diners order alcoholic beverages at brunch versus 40% at dinner. Plus, Pernomo, the restaurant owner in New York, says diners' habits have changed. They don't like to stay out late anymore. Brunch lets him make up for some of the business he's lost from the dinner crowd. People are tending to eat earlier now than they have in, I would say, a long time. For a long time, 8 o'clock was the ideal reservation. Now, dinner peaks at 6, and during brunch, noon. I'm Kristen Schwab for Marketplace. And in New York, I'm Sabri Beneshore with the Marketplace Morning Report. From APM, American Public Media.